Larry Hoover here. Today I want to talk about business plans. In my classes, I talk about how to do a business plan. I've reviewed, gosh, probably 500 business plans, business ideas in the last couple of years. But a lot of them are what some people might call a formal business plan, you know, all typed up and everything. Uh, and I actually encourage the idea of a, a pretty intense business plan. At the same time, I'm preaching this and teaching this. There are people out there saying, oh, don't bother with a business plan. It'll, the day you finish it, it'll be wrong, and uh, you can't predict the future anyway. How can you know how things are going to turn out? Just kind of go out and feel your way along. I understand their thinking, and I think some of it's good. There's a thing called lean startup, which is kind of like, okay, if you've got a piece of software, don't make it perfect. Get it out there. Let customers try it. Get feedback from them. Improve it bit by bit. Go back and forth, more of an iterative process, a, you know, uh, a learning uh, back and forth, back and forth, trial and error. And I absolutely believe in that. I absolutely believe in listening to your customers and adapting. Uh, any entrepreneur who doesn't adapt to change is a dead duck. You have to be flexible. But at the same time, I think business plans are incredibly important. Here's why. A, a, a few reasons. Uh, for starters, if you're going to try to predict the future, and I think that's important. And I think you can, in many aspects of your business, predict the future. I mean, you're trying to estimate your utility bills a year out. It's not rocket science. It's not that hard. You're trying to estimate how many people it'll take to program your software. Well, if you make certain assumptions about what software you're going to be writing, you can probably estimate that. And so some things are pretty predictable. You know you're going to need to go buy this big computer or this big printer or whatever, capital equipment. The only way you're going to be able to predict things, let's say revenue, because a lot of times that's people tell me, say, I'm going to start a website. I don't know how many people will sign up. Let's just get it up and see what happens. The only way you're going to learn how to predict revenue is by trying it and practicing it. If you're starting there with this startup and you're saying, okay, in, in uh, a year I'm going to have 30,000 users, and, you know, somebody may say, well, you don't know that. Why even write that down? No, no. If you write that down, you say, I'm going to have 30,000 users next May. You get to next May and you have 29,000 users, you'll feel pretty good about your ability to predict things. If you have 70,000 users, you'll feel pretty good about the business, but not real good about your ability to predict things. And if you have 5,000 users, you'll feel bad about everything. <laughs> the thing is, only by doing that do you begin to understand what you understand and what you don't. And only by thinking hard about the future can we begin to predict the future. And, and keep in mind, most things are predictable. You hear all this stuff, the black swan and everything, and chaos theory, and totally unpredictable. Change comes out of nowhere. Butterfly flaps its wings, and the other side of the world, the whole steel economy changes or whatever. Hey, it, there are things that are unpredictable. Uh, nobody saw the iPod coming. Everybody had MP3 players. There were companies making them. Uh, you know, nobody really saw the whole smartphone. I mean, you know, Apple had tried to newt, and it was a disaster. Everybody thought fax machines are big, expensive things only big companies have. And all of a sudden, they're in, like, everybody's house with those thermal papers. So there are things that are unpredictable, or at least the rates at which they happen and when they happen are unpredictable. But by definition, if something's unpredictable, it's not predictable. And the time and energy you spend thinking about it might be fun, not real productive. On the other hand, most things follow a pattern. They go up. They go down, you know. It's draw a line. This is time across here. And whatever you're measuring, sales, number of subscribers, number of employees, I don't care. They go up. They go down. They follow geometric curves. They follow S-shaped curves. They cycle sometimes. And you start by looking at the past when you have a past. Don't got that in a startup. I understand that. I've done four startups and thought about a lot more. But to see where you're going and to understand the best way to learn is to make projections and then get feedback. So you say, I'm going to have 30,000 subscribers. You hit 21. Well, that's 70% of your goal. Next year, you say, well, do 80. You hit 56, 70% again. Well, you got a pattern going. Maybe the next time, you should lower your projection by 30%. You will learn. You will get better at it. You will understand the business like none of your competitors do. And for that reason, I believe making projections is critically important. The next thing is, yeah, the business plan is not a 
cast in stone. It's not like I've done the plan now, I'm just going to go carry it out. No. Like they say about battles, you know, a battle plan becomes invalid the minute the first shot is fired. Same true of a business plan. It has to be flexible and breathing so you don't get stuck in it because that's a big mistake. Next thing about business plan, I had somebody come to my office and I said, you have a business plan? They said, no. I said, why not? They said, oh, I'm not looking for investors. It, it ain't about investors. It's about you. Business plans are for the entrepreneur. It's a tool you use to put your ideas down on paper, to see your numbers, to put it all together, and to, and to be able to think about it and think clearly. Nothing clarifies thinking like writing it down. Nothing shows up stupid ideas like looking at them in the light of day. Ty first of all, can you even type it up? Can you say what you believe in? Can you make it crystal clear? Then you got that, you write that up. Show it to reasonably bright sixth graders. Show it to your grandmother. Show it to your friends and relatives. Show it to all si types of people. Do they at least understand what you're saying? Whether they believe it's a good idea or not, do they at least understand it? And you read it because things show, and read it out loud because when something's typed up, you'll, you'll pick up a lot of your mistakes if you read it out loud. If, it, if in, in most cases, if your writing comes closer to your speaking, it'll be more natural and more true. Next thing about business plans, they have to have heart and head. I've seen more business plans for like people my age that have been in the corporate world and now they want to start their business and it's all beautiful text, wonderfully written, all dreamy stuff. There's no numbers. There's no projections. I see other business plans, probably more of them, from students in business schools, graduate business schools, MBA programs, beautiful spreadsheets. Everything adds up. Everything is neat, concise. There's no passion. There's no words in it. You can't have one without the other. And I find when I do a business plan, as I work through it, like my last idea was a museum concept. And at one point, I'm writing the words. I'm saying, we're going to have more customer service than any museum on earth. And, and, and you're going to walk in the door, and there are going to be three or four people run up and say, hello, how are you? Welcome to our place. You know, unheard of in the museum business, you know? And, and, and oh, yeah, it's great. And I got that written in the text. And then a few days, a few weeks later, I'm working on the spreadsheets. And I'm working out payroll by hour, by time of day, and all that jazz, by day of the week in the month of the year based on the seasonality of the industry. And I say, wait a minute. On a Monday morning, if you walk in this museum as a customer and say, you're going to be saying, uh, is anybody here? Anybody here? I, I want to buy a ticket. Anybody here? Because ain't got no staff there at that time of day. You know, that's our low, low uh, uh, Monday in February, whatever. So I see my words and my numbers aren't matching. They aren't jiving. So I've either got to lower my expectation for the customer experience or I've got to raise my numbers on that payroll at that soft time of the year. they got to get together. And over time, the words and the numbers, because I keep going back and forth, whether it's an hour in the words, an hour in the numbers, a month in the words, a month in the numbers, a week in the words, a week in the numbers, going back and forth and back and forth. And over time, they close in together, and the words and numbers come together, and they really begin to sing. And, and that's when you've really got something. So to put it all together, I think business plans are critically important. They're for you. They've got to be adaptable. They've got to be changeable. And, and once you've got it, once you've written the business plan for you, then that core document, that, that imagery you've painted, that vision you've created for your enterprise, and what you think you want it to be and where you want it to head, then that can be the source for documents for bankers, for investors, for future employees, for partners, for lawyers, accountants, customers, you know, uh, all your suppliers, your vendors, to understand what you're doing. So I think it can have all these other implications, but it's got to start with a highly personal document. Uh, and, 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 and when I look at them, I've reviewed, I've graded a lot of business plans. Think of it, think of it as a legal case. You are building a case for your enterprise. You're trying to prove to me or to your mom or to yourself or your spouse, you're trying to prove to me a series of things. You're trying to prove to me that there's an opportunity here, that there's a market, whether it's one that was something the customers really know they need or they don't quite know what they need. I mean, you know, nobody walked around before Federal Express saying, how can we live without Federal Express? Nobody walked around before I started to my friends when I started the bookstop bookstore chain, oh, we need giant bookstores. Nobody walked around. Actually, Henry Ford said, if I'd given the customers what they wanted, I would have given them a faster horse, you know? So sometimes the customers don't know what they need, but you can extrapolate. When I figured out the bookstore thing, I knew customers loved giant toy stores with low prices, with big selections. 
Toys R Us. And I said, if they like it in toy stores, I bet you they'll like it in bookstores. So I could, you know, put it together and make a, build a case that there's a demand here and a, and a market need. I also have to build a case that I'm passionate about it. I have to show that I care, that I love the business, that I've spent hours going to industry trade shows, meeting people in the industry, studying the industry, finding out its strengths and weaknesses. I really understand my context and landscape. I have to prove that. I have to prove nobody else is already doing it, or at least not doing it the way that I see it being done. And then as you move through the steps and you have revenue and profits and expense, the more you prove the better. And, and I believe, because a big question that comes up among the entrepreneurs I teach is, well, how do I know when to quit my job? How do I know when to go start it up? How do I know when to go uh, hire people away and say, okay, you're going to risk your life or your career the next year or so or whatever. Come to work for me. Quit your job. I think that research, that thinking the project through, doing the studies, learning the competition, learning the industry, that those are the things that give you the confidence that you finally get to the point and say, yeah, this is a great opportunity. This is the right time to do it. I'm the right person to do it. Nobody else is doing it. Let's go for it. And, 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 and I also have to say in there, you have to prove to me the economics, what you think people will pay for it, what the pricing will be, what your cost will be, at least the best you can. But in some ways, in some ways, that is more of an estimate. That is more of a guess than, say, um, whether I'm passionate about it or not. And in some ways, maybe it's more of a guess than is there a need for it. But you do need to prove to me, prove to yourself that, no, it looks like this uh, can make money. Because if you aren't making money, you're not going to be around. And you're not going to be sustainable because you're not going to have money to invest in future projects to save for a rainy day. And, and I don't care if you're a for-profit organization or a non-profit enterprise, you have to have a profit. You have to have a sustainable model for revenue and expenses. Well, I think that's enough for today. That's why I'll stand with do a business plan and do a great one. Gary Hoover, I'll see you later.